Lynn family make their way up, I'm going to introduce who they are. I, t- I told you that Neva used to come home from Franklin Road Academy as a teacher there when we lived in Nashville, and she kept talking about this, well, this lady that just didn't fit the mold. Her name was Rachel England, and uh, she was um, just going to live a perfect life. And from best I can see, she has done that with her compadres. Uh, They moved from Nashville to uh, near Hershey, Pennsylvania, where her husband, Robbie, serves as a physician's assistant. And she has um, cared for four children. They're stair steps. You will find them premiering at Hallmark every Monday and uh, Tuesday. I mean, they look... The two things that have happened over the last week have been that I have lied. I've lied to Neva numerous times about why I would be wanting to rent a cello uh, over the weekend. Uh, she went with me to pick it up, and she said, Who is this now? And I, why do we need this cello, and why, why do you, a non-musician, pick this up? I said, Neva, I'm making my de- debut tomorrow. None of you laughed about that. I mean, that's not funny at all, Yeah. The other thing was that um, they are all musical. She has trained them. And that little thing that she has on uh, the cello over there, the children, if they have marks on them, that will be from that little stick that she has used on them. Obviously, none of that's true. But they are all very musical. They're going to play an instrumental for us today. And if anybody uh, ever wanted to meet an incredible family, well, that's them. I will tell you that uh, Robbie comes here typically once or twice a year because he's on the board at God's Bible School over in Cincinnati. And so uh, we get to see them regularly. What you may not know is that this is not their first concert on that piano. Every time they come to town, we make our way up and we come into the church. And Neva and I, uh, the adopted uncle and aunt of this family... We come and bribe them with banana muffins so that they will play a concert for us. And so we've never had a cello. We've never had the fullness of this. But we have today the England family uh, doing an instrumental they did, I guess, around Christmas time. Is that correct? Okay. Here they are.
what you don't know is that I uh, found out that they were, it, is it your birthday today, Rachel, or is it yesterday? And so I rented a jet and flew them in. Uh, actually, they were in uh, Indianapolis for something and texted me a few days ago and said, we're thinking about coming by. And of course, me always looking for a free concert. So I said, come on. And we, we, we gathered the instruments that they use. And um, so there you have it. They got out of the car from Indianapolis about 20 minutes <laughs> before the service started. So that was quite something. First Sunday of the new year, it's pretty common for folks to come to church with ideas about what they're going to be doing over the next 12 months. And it's no different here. Let me guess on some of those for you. You exercise more. You will pray more. And you will, in fact, eat less. Liar, liar, liars, all of you. <laughs> no, but those are certainly some of the things that we think about. Today we're even taking down our own decorations here. You've probably been doing that at your own home. We did it at ours, and what I discovered was the more I took off, the more dirt I saw. And so that was disappointing, to say the least. Now, the truth is there are probably more effective and more environmentally conscious ways of doing this whole thing. So let me give you an overview of some home remedies. Grandma may have headed back to the winter, uh, to the warmth of a uh, of the South, but here are some things. Does the bathtub look dull and spotted? Well, then, just juice up a couple of grapefruit you got from that fruit basket from your boss. Add four tablespoons of salt, and you give it a rub down. That's right. That's a home remedy. The tub will look new, and it'll even smell a little bit like Florida also goes for some brass and chrome fixtures. They will shine if you put together what is the known ingredients of two things that everybody knows about. How about these two? You'll see them on the screen. Lemon juice and baking soda. You put those two together. You've known this for years. If you need to scrub something down, those are some of the things. Now, after looking at some of these home remedies, I came to the conclusion that really when you get to the end of life, the only two things you need are baking soda and duct tape, when you think about it. I mean, you can almost do anything with those two things. The point is there are lots of natural ways to go about cleaning our lives, and we often do that. But the fact of the matter also is that we need to go do some what my wife determines is deep cleaning in our house. I would call it soul cleaning for us today. So if you got your folder, you want to go along, we've got an outline in there. And we're looking at the lectionary, really, today. And it's the first chapter of Mark, one of my, if not my favorite, uh, gospel, because it was the first. Now, I'm going to show you a picture and see if everybody knows who this person is. Everybody know who he is? Do you know how old Mr. Clean is? Look it up sometime. Now, we think it, he only came along later, I think in the 50s or 60s, when... Procter and Gamble bought his image, but he's been around much longer than even that. But Mr. Clean, I kept thinking of an image that I would think about with John the Baptist, and he is, in fact, John the Sanitizer, or Mr. Clean, if you would. We know a bit about him, and so we're going to glance at that and then move forward. But Mark uses his picture here, unlike Luke. Now, Luke gives a more of a connection to Jesus, but Mark, who is the first gospel, gives a rather stark but realistic picture of who John the Baptist really is. He has come to announce the arrival of Christ and to hopefully do some sanitizing and some preparation, if you would. So we're going to look at some cleaning tips. Cleaning tips. Three cleaning tips for the new year. First, we will all use what we put in the outline, at least. We'll use natural or what I would call you want to put it in parentheses supernatural cleaning uh, opportunities ingredients if you would John's ministry is about as organic as you can get I mean my uh, daughter is on this you know do, do you realize that once Google came out children have no use for parents I mean they can just Google it and so my wife and I are smarter than they could ever imagine, but, but she knows more about raising her children and more about, and notice they're not here today, for the reason I'm talking about them. They were here last week. Uh, but they can always find out the answer to whatever problem they have by Googling it. 
And the fact is, they are, are so smart that they are organic people now. And so what they began to teach us was that organic milk is good milk, and whatever it is that we drink is not good milk. Well, we told them we bought organic, and now when they come to our house, we have organic milk there. So we showed them on that issue. But organic, you know, we hear that word, it's used a lot because... But really, when I think about it, the organic nature of John the Sanitizer's ministry was, look at who, how he was. he was. He was connected to the New Testament and the Old Testament. He, he was a picture of who it was that they had been imagining. It was this messenger that was to come. Scriptures had told them, Malachi and Isaiah, they had wrapped all those scriptures together. And so Mark is telling them, you know, look back into your past at the election you've gone through as being chosen by God's people, the sin that you have faced, the exile that you've experienced, and now the redemption that you have. And they see this man who had camel's hair and locusts and wild honey to eat. And he kind of fit the profile of their history and fortunately, probably even their future. He was the Mr. Clean or the Mr. Sanitizer that was there to remind them that God had, in fact, cared for them all those years, and he was not going to stop now. John uses the most basic ingredients of all, water, if you can imagine that. And John stands at the Jordan River, which was the same river that Israel had crossed to enter into the Promised Land so many generations before. And so John sees his ministry at the beginning is kind of a new exodus, if you would. He's picking up all these images and he's throwing them to the people and saying, you know, I'm a part of the old and I'm a part of introducing you to the new. And so just as Israel had passed through the waters of the Red Sea and then to the Jordan, now God's people have the opportunity to pass through the water, this new water, this baptismal water that God, in fact, would bring to them and he would, we would experience what he called the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, what we often think of is that baptism started, well, back when Baptists started. You know, we, we basically see Baptist and baptism as connected. The fact is, all kinds of ritual uses of water, particularly immersion, was used as far back as Moses, if you can imagine that. I'm going to introduce you to a a big 50 cent word, mikveh. Mikveh is a Hebrew word that means a gathering or a collection of water. And if you know anybody Jewish, then they're going to be very familiar with this. Certainly, the updated versions, they still have these collection of waters, these ritual waters, where they often use them at different points in their lives. And so, here we have a reference to that kind of... So, they would have known that. In other words, I say all that to say, when, when John came to talk to them about being baptized... They weren't lost with that word. Uh, baptismo, the word there means immersion. They weren't, that wasn't a completely new idea to them because they had experienced it all in their Old Testament since. They knew about that. What was crazy about it was that it was now used in a new and a fresh and a different way. And so one of the suggestions has to do with the, for you and me, is the stain that we have in our lives what is it that happened to them all those 70 years of being exiled and then they came back and they were still under domination by another country and so the words that he introduces to us are words that we need to hear every new year the word of repentance and forgiveness of sins and if you don't hear those words ever again in life hear them today to mean that you, they are, in fact, to you, the words of life. Because repentance means that moment when you recognize you cannot do this on your own. This thing called life. And so it is all the stuff that has loaded itself into your life now needs to be unloaded. And there is a turning around. Repentance means a turning around and going in a new direction. And the only way we can do that is to know that there is someone who, in fact, can forgive us. There is a horror movie called The Messenger. You're going to see a picture in just a moment. It's about the Solomon family who move into an apparently serene farmhouse. That's right. That's the picture if you've seen the movie. And what they have is a stain on the wall that they keep going to. And they keep trying to wash the stain away. And it keeps coming back every time. 
until finally a ghost comes through there. Now we'll move that picture off because it's a pretty gory looking picture. But the reason they do that in the movies is they got you because we all know that there is a sense in all of us, particularly at the beginning of the year, where we would like to move on from some things and every year there is a kind of repetition to the fact, will we ever get away from it? We keep saying these hopes, we keep having these dreams about living a life that's free in Christ and we find ourselves with that stain kind of holding on to us and, and threatening us. And what you need to know at the beginning of a new year is be gone with it because it doesn't have to remain there. That stain of sin does not have to remain there with you. The first time Jesus appears in the gospel, what's the word he says? Repent. Because he knows that at the end of the day, that's what you and I most need. And repentance is both brutally honest and joyously received. Brutally honest that it takes you being brutally honest to be able to say, honestly, earnestly, I want my life turned around. And then when that is engaged, when that happens, when that is true, when that repentance, that turning around happens, there is an incredible joy that happens because of that. Why? Because you are leaving the past that you want to leave. And you are embracing the hope that you have, in fact, found in Christ. And so if John was right, and we believe that he was, then, then God was about to send one to do something that had never been done. And the time was right for something new. And so... John reminds us that the natural ingredients of the Word of God, Scripture, and the water of baptism. So what are those ingredients? First, use supernatural ingredients. Secondly, know what kind of stain that you're removing. There is the little sin, little s sin, and there's the big s sin. If you've taken any kind of theology class or understanding, you know what those are. The little sin is the day-to-day -day moments when you and I knowingly or even subconsciously commit an act that separates us from the will of God. But the big S is that sin nature, that part of us that leans towards sinning. And we could talk for days about this, but some denominations have been built around the fact that, that it is a separate step. But what it is for us is that we move away from our sin nature. And if I'm still wrapped in my sin nature the same way I was wrapped in my sin nature when I was an 18-year-old and I walked down this aisle and accepted Christ, then something's wrong. I had no idea what the big S was. But I learned about it as I tried to remove that sin nature from my life and deal with it. I don't near have the inclination towards sin that I had back then. And how did that happen? It happened because the stain of sin was removed from my life, and I knew I had, through Christ, the capability of living a life free from that death. Because ultimately, sin is death. So you and I get to separate ourselves from that which plagues us today. Thirdly, clean with a purpose. Clean with a purpose. John baptized them with a cleansing power of water. But it was repentance and the forgiveness of sins was the first step that moved to what? Verse 8, it says, with the Holy Spirit. And that was another thing I had no idea about but have learned immensely about in my own life. What Christ was doing in that act of being baptized that day was not that he had sin and needed to be baptized, no. He was acting on our behalf and going before us in a way that said, I am totally with you. I am both man and God and I have come to so identify with you that I am willing to walk through these waters as a way of leading you to know that there, are, there will be a time in your life when water baptism will be incredibly important. Nothing mystical or magical about it, but something incredibly significant about it. The first Sunday of a year is a good time. It's a good opportunity to do what I would call some soul cleaning in your life. 
having a person in law enforcement now makes me think about these kind of things. And I thought the other day about a dye pack. Have you ever thought about a dye pack? I'm going to show you a picture of what happens. They place a dye pack inside. The bankers place a little pack there. It's an electronic thing. It sits on a piece of metal in the bank. And then when it's removed from that piece of metal, at least my reading of it, it activates it. And so by a radio frequency at a, at a certain time, it will explode. And the stain goes all over it. That's, in that case, fake money that's placed within all the other money. And I looked at it. I wasn't going to show you. They were about as gory as some of the pictures that I showed you from that movie a minute ago. But what happens to the people carrying that and how it covers them? And I thought of that and thought, that's a symbol of so many lives, all tied up, putting our lives into something that ultimately explodes. Why? Because it was never meant to last. It's never been eternal. And so for you and me today, those stains remind me of stains that, that make no difference. But there is this body and blood of Christ that we come to celebrate today that makes all the difference in the world. Have you ever tried to rub something, to wash something off and it wouldn't come off? Today, when we come forward, what we're saying is that Christ washed it all. The little S and the big S. He, he took care of all of our distance from him by allowing Christ, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those three in one allowed us to know God the Father, to experience the fullness of forgiveness of sin through Christ, and then to know the Holy Spirit and all its day-to-day -day attention to our lives. And so when we come here, we're going to perform a, a simple act. And as I told you earlier, I'm going to ask that you would come forward. We do it so many different ways, but today they've got a glove, and I would ask that you come and just hold your hands up. Allow them to place the element in your hand, and then you pick it up and then dip it into the juice and take it. If you want to take it back to your seat and pause for a moment, you certainly can do that. This is not about doing it properly. It's about doing it with a sense of your God's only claim on your life. So I'm going to read uh, the scripture that we often read as we do the elements, but there, of course we'll be doing the elements together. For I received from the Lord in which I had also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus in the night which we betrayed took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me the same way he took the cup after supper saying the cup is the new covenant of my blood do it as often as you drink it in remembrance of me let's pray together and you come at your own time father we are delighted to stand on the threshold of a new year knowing that we do not do this alone, that we commit ourselves again to you. And how in this incredible act of communion, we see your picture. We see your provision. We don't just see some simple pieces of bread and juice. We see your body given and your life taken. And yet in the middle of all that, we discover that they didn't take your life at all. You gave it for us. Stir us, Father, as we receive these elements. We pray this in Christ's name.